This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to the war in Ukraine. As calls grow for Russia's war on Ukraine to end, a number of recent developments indicate the war could be expanding beyond the borders of Ukraine. Earlier today, Russia signed an agreement with Belarus to begin deploying tactical nuclear weapons in the former Soviet state. The Kremlin said the move was a response to what it called the, quote, sharp escalation of threats on the western borders of Russia and Belarus. Earlier this week, a group of pro-Ukrainian fighters from Russia attacked sites in the Russian region of Belgorod using what appears to be U.S.-made armor vehicles and Humvees. The Biden administration has denied any U.S. involvement in the cross-border raid. On Wednesday, National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby said, quote, we don't support the use of U.S.-made equipment for attacks inside Russia. The cross-border raid was carried out in part by a group called the Russian Volunteer Corps. According to the Financial Times, the group includes self-avowed neo-Nazis. Meanwhile, The New York Times reports U.S. intelligence agencies believe the recent drone attack on the Kremlin was likely carried out by a Ukrainian special military or intelligence unit. The Times says it remains unclear if Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky or his top officials were aware of the operation. This comes as a top Ukrainian military intelligence official has admitted to the German publication Die Welt that Ukraine is seeking to assassinate both Russian President Vladimir Putin and Wagner Group founder Yevgeny Prigozhin. Fighting continues around the devastated Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, which has been largely seized by Russia after a brutal fight. Russia is also continuing to attack other Ukrainian cities. On Wednesday, Russian aircraft destroyed a kindergarten in the Sumy region. We're joined now by two guests. Gregory Afenigenev is a professor of Russian history at Georgetown University. His recent piece for Jacobin is headlined, Peace in Ukraine Isn't Coming Soon. He joins us from Stamford, New York. And in the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv is Denis Pilash. He's a Ukrainian political scientist and historian. He's a member of the Ukrainian democratic socialist organization Sotsnyalny Ruch and also an editor at Commons, Journal of Social Criticism. Welcome both to Democracy Now! Denis Pilash, uh, I'd like to begin with you. Uh, you're in Kyiv, the Ukrainian capital, which has recently witnessed a spate of attacks from a uh, Russia. If you could describe what the scene is uh, on the ground in, in Kyiv. Well, uh, hello. And uh, I should start with uh, everyone living in, in Ukraine can witness and experience that sheer amount of devastation that was inflicted by the Russian invasion on our country. And actually, we've been living here for more than a year in a situation of a constant um, air raid alerts and um, shellings and uh, missile strikes on major cities, with uh, entire cities in the eastern part of Ukraine raised to the ground. So Bakhmut is uh, being the last in the list, um, as this infamous grinders there is ongoing since uh, from last uh, summer. Uh, but as um, well, um, it seems that the army of invasion. Uh, failed to uh, complete its uh, tasks, and uh, Ukrainian resistance um, did overcome the, the Russian plans. So uh, Russia uh, is uh, unleashing um, both indiscriminate attacks on the civilian population in the re residential areas, and it, it was also their major strategy this winter when they targeted um, specifically civilian infrastructure. So uh, they tried to freeze Ukrainians to death by destroying power plants, energy grids, water supplies, heating, but ultimately didn't succeed as uh, uh, workers uh, and engineers of Ukraine. They almost did miracles in restoring the infrastructure. And also the air, air defense has become more efficient. So most of Russian missiles and drones are being uh, intercepted. So, uh, contrary to some um, talking point popular in um, some Western circles, foreign military aid can um, save um, civilian lives. Uh, but recently, these resumed waves of missile attacks, they claimed many dozens of lives when uh, they hit 
uh, multi-story apartment buildings in places like Uman and Dnipro. But for instance, in Kyiv, uh, the um, almost we have, uh, uh, albeit we have every day multiple air uh, air, ra air raids. Uh, but um, the vast majority of these uh, missiles and drones are intercepted, so people are got to some accustomed to some kind of this living under constant uh, attacks. So, uh, for instance, in our university, we've already conducted our um, classes like in the basement, in the um, bomb shelters. So uh, it, it becomes some uh, very frightening, but part of this so-called new normality and this very thin veil that um, um, actually uh, hides this uh, brutality of war. Uh, it can be just uh, overcome when you open your social um, media um, news feed and you'll see the, this continuation of obituaries. So almost everyone has uh, already um, friends or relatives who, whose lives have been lost um, and many of, of these are civilians. And, Dennis, could you also respond to the latest news, which we uh, read in our introduction, namely that uh, uh, Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner mercenary group, has said that they will start withdrawing uh, from Bakhmut. He also said that 20,000 of his fighters, of Wagner fighters, had been killed in the battle for the city. Uh, he also said the head of uh, half of whom, uh, half of the 20,000 who were killed uh, were former prisoners recruited by Wagner. You've said that Wagner is like Blackwater on steroids. So if you could respond to the news and also explain what you mean by that, what has Wagner been responsible for? So uh, Wagner Group is probably one of the most notorious units inside the Russian war machine, and uh, it has its level, its degree of autonomy. Thus, the, all these conflicts with the official uh, Russian army and the Ministry of Defense. But actually, it uh, has been used extensively by by the Russian regime uh, to do all 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 the black. Um, very nasty things, uh, not just in Ukraine, but uh, in many regions of the world, in Syria, in Africa. We actually had uh, recently a call of solidarity um, with uh, activists from different African countries, from uh, Sudan to South Africa and uh, Mauritius. And uh, well, uh, we learned a lot about uh, this presence of Wagner Group there, and actually. Um, Sudan was the first country that was uh, t targeted by, by um, Wagner mercenaries when the now ousted dictator uh, Omar Bashir uh, led, led them into his country and in a very neo-colonial or even uh, classical 19th century uh, colonialism way of uh, doing things, they started looting the uh, natural resources, namely the gold of, of, of the country, and they were very heavily involved into all uh, the conflicts there. And now we are inside another um, conflict in Sudan, where both sides have links to, to, to Russia and have links to the Wagner Group, and specifically, like the um, the head of the Janjaweed, who who is now who was responsible for the Darfur genocide and who is now waging this uh, war against uh, other generals in Sudan. He was in Moscow on the day of in Russia's invasion of Ukraine and assured Putin is his full, full support. So this was only the starting point, and ultimately Wagner became some backbone for many military dictatorships in several um, African countries. So it seems that uh, they are very ruthless. They include people who are also coming from a far right um, uh, white uh, supremacist background. Uh, they are usually linked to lots of um, war crimes, both in the Middle East, in Africa and in Ukraine. And it seems that uh, Prigozhin tries to uh, grab every opportunity, every publicity to uh, probably um, make his appearance even more notorious, uh, because uh, he wants to use this in some possible future power struggle inside Russia. So it seems that he tries to underline uh, like his importance both in uh, internal and foreign policy of Russia. And this makes him uh, an even 
uh, more uh, notorious uh, figure for many people in the post-Soviet space who are afraid that even if uh, Putin's regime is gone, it may may be replaced with something like uh, this kind of uh, even more outright ultranationalist and militarist uh, regime like Prigozhin. Yeah, and only to add that a, a recent UN report accused Wagner mercenaries of involvement in a March 2022 massacre in a village in Mali. Uh, where nearly 500 people were killed. Uh, I'd like to go now to uh, Professor uh, Gregory Afenigenev. Uh, you're a professor of Russian history. Your recent piece for Jacobin is headlined, Peace in Ukraine Isn't Coming Soon. Uh, could you explain why you believe uh, peace, peace negotiations are not possible at the moment, and indeed why you make the argument that the question is not so much of the U.S. pushing Ukraine to negotiate, but that whatever agreement is reached would result in a very long-standing standoff uh, between Ukraine and Russia, akin to what happened in Korea or uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Yeah, I think um, if you look at the context of what's happening in both Ukrainian and Russian societies as a result of the invasion, both societies are becoming highly polarized, in which uh, obviously, in Russia, liberals have been not only imprisoned, but effectively exiled or threatened with conscription, massive fines, and so on. But even uh, passive supporters of the invasion are uh, held to a particular standard in terms of even uh, high-profile supporters have been had their private phone calls leaked uh, in what appears to be, uh, you know, an attempt by the street state to threaten them. Um, and of course, this has also affected the way that the elite competition plays out as uh, uh, Denise mentioned with Prigozhin, right? Um, the Russian elite that is competing now for the spot of designated heir to Putin wants to be uh, seen as more militaristic, wants to be seen as more patriotic, more aggressive than its rivals. And any of the sort of soft, technocratic liberals that you might have seen 10 years ago have largely been cowed into submission or disappeared, not to say that they would be any better necessarily. Um, and of course, in Ukrainian society, uh, positions that were more or less socially consensus or at least a solid middle ground 10, 15 years ago uh, have now become symptomatic of uh, uh, dedication to Putinism or support for Russia that uh, is now grounds for essentially removal from Ukrainian political life. And so the sole uh, legitimate contenders for uh, political power in Ukraine are highly uh, nationalist and highly bent on um, recovering the territories lost to Russia, which, of course, is completely understandable, considering the uh, the uh, awful, horrendous nature of this invasion and the true scope of all the lives and the, and the land has been lost. Um, so as a result, you know, this is not something that the U.S. has caused. It's not something that the U.S. is it's some, of course, some, the U.S. is perpetuating it in the sense that it's preventing Ukraine from losing. But the underlying social tensions here are not something that the U.S. can remove by asking for negotiations. These societies are now deeply at odds in a way that's going to persist for many, many years. And you've said, uh, as against uh, recent speculations, you've said that uh, Russia has been preparing politically for this war for at least a decade. Could you explain what you mean by that and, and how so? I think um, the sequence of events that started with uh, the U.S. invasion of Libya and also with the opposition Bolotnaya protests in Russia, uh, right around the same moment in 2011, I think this was a moment of reckoning for Putin in the sense that uh, he believed that unless he changed things very radically, he would be at risk of some kind of regime change internal operation. Now, whether that's justified or not, I can't say. But um, and that's not to say that this wasn't based on a paranoid fantasy, and it is. Of course, it's linked to an idea of the West not too dis distant from DeSantis's, right, as something that is a force for, that is a kind of woke virus that seeks to implant liberalism everywhere around the world and, uh, you know, remove respect for traditional values and so on, right? So the invasion of Ukraine was the sort of foreign policy version of that initiative. And when Maidan took place, Putin realized that he could not do to Ukraine what he had previously done to Belarus, which is to make it a uh, highly politically authoritarian and highly politically subservient puppet state, in, and which has gotten even worse, of course, since 2020, uh, when the pro-democracy protests were brutally suppressed. Um, 
So the, the military route here is an attempt by Putin to uh, ensure that uh, that there is no sort of visible post-Soviet challenge to the Russian world order uh, or the Russian image of the world order. Now, the failure of this invasion, uh, of course, it's good news for Ukrainians, but it's not necessarily good news for Russian foreign policy. I think it reflects that it kind of reflects the sense, at least for me, that the regime is entering a kind of spiral of uh, aggression and internal dysfunction that is not at risk of ending anytime soon. So, Denis Pilash, could you respond to what uh, Professor uh, Afeni Ganev said? And also, you know, you're a socialist activist. If you could explain uh, where the left in Ukraine now stands uh, on this war, you, you've mentioned that um, the left in Ukraine describes the situation as, quote, surviving between Russian tanks and Western banks. Could you elaborate? Okay, so yes, I I would just add probably that uh, this type of thinking that is um, now manifested by by the Kremlin elites and Putin himself, it's um, very akin to some kind of uh, Western far right conspiracy theories, and it's uh, um, deeply rooted in the persuasion that no kind of uh, inner change, no kind of revolution, no kind of popular revolt is possible without any foreign meddling. So they consider any kind of uh, popular unrest as something that is somehow uh, manufactured by by the foreign enemies and competitors of, of your state. So actually, this is a deeply conservative um, worldview. And uh, of course, it's uh, based on, first of all, uh, this very deep um, fear of uh, their own people that uh, ultimately um, some kind of new revolution is possible uh, also in, in the Russian Federation. So this uh, makes Russia some kind of um, like in uh, 19th century, Tsar Nicholas I was called the gendarme of Europe as he was suppressing the revolutionary movements like in Hungary. Uh, so in, in this way, they also uh, try to act in the post-Soviet space as this uh, conservative safeguards helping the authoritarian regimes to to keep their populations in in cages essentially but uh, to speak about uh, to address the situation of the ukrainian left so yes we are in this uh, challenge that together with the entire population of ukraine we are um, we need to uh, do this existential fight essentially for the survival of uh, Ukraine as a separate entity, as a separate republic, but also we need to preserve uh, this space for democratic action and to preserve the space for social change. And uh, this is very deeply connected with the issues of um, already wartime economy and post-war reconstruction, as um, what has been exposed at uh, international um, forums like the Lugano conference, and now there will be another conference in London dedicated to the uh, post-war reconstruction of Ukraine. Both uh, the Ukrainian and Western ruling classes, they, uh, they tend to uh, apply mostly uh, very pro-market, very uh, business-friendly and business-oriented um, uh, approaches in uh, this reconstruction, and essentially they will uh, try also to use the situation that was created by uh, this uh, Russian war of aggression to uh, further, um, like, make um, more more offensive on on um, the social state and um, the public sector in Ukraine. Uh, while we, as Ukrainian leftists, uh, uh, socialists, trade unionists, feminists, environmentalists, and other activists, uh, we feel that, uh, on the contrary, the country that has been so heavily um, torn by the war, uh, it needs uh, expansion of the welfare state. It, it needs expansion of uh, the public sectors, as uh, we will have. Uh, we already have a huge need in social housing. This shouldn't be left to corrupt private contractors that have been already destroying our cities from inside. Uh, we will have an enormous number of people with, um, who uh, 
uh, were injured in the war, people with disabilities, with PTSD. And this uh, means that we need more hospitals, we need more uh, medical and uh, psychological help, and we also need to create protection for those who have been affected by the war, for the veterans and for the civilians alike. And actually, this is a kind of reconstruction that uh, was um, uh, in many European countries after the victory over the fascist Texas in the Second World War, when, ac when actually the uh, working classes and uh, organized labor, trade unions, in many places they were empowered by this anti-fascist uh, victory enthusiasm, and they could pressure their uh, governments to more concessions and to a more socially oriented, more socially uh, just uh, way of reconstructing the economy and the country in general. So uh, this, uh, I think this is also a point where uh, an international left and international progressive movements also can make a difference by pressuring their governments to a more socially, genderly, ecologically just um, reconstruction of Ukraine, and also uh, taking the issue of Ukraine into the bigger uh, picture of uh, the countries of the periphery. And we actually, at our journal Commons, now um, launched a project called Dialogue with the Peripheries, because we feel that people in Ukraine and Central Eastern Europe in general, they need to build more bridges with the so-called Global South, with the peoples of uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia, because we face different, we have different histories and different colonial and uh, imperialist oppressors. But actually, we face very uh, similar patterns of dependency. And we actually uh, need to counter them together in solidarity for, um, for instance, such cases as uh, debt cancellation. Again, you cannot have a running war economy and post-war economy when you your country is obliged to this vicious circle of debt. And Ukraine isn't the first one that was trapped inside. So uh, we need to, to build this uh, more internationalist and more global front for, for change that would defy any kind of uh, imperialists in any forms, be it the Russian tanks, yes, uh, the direct brute force that is uh, espoused by Russia, not just in Ukraine, but in many other uh, places, or more sneaky kinds of uh, other uh, forms of dependency that can be, for instance, um, imposed by the international uh, financial organizations. So, Professor Afanigenov, if you could respond to, to what Dennis said, you have also pointed out that the war has been a kind of shock doctrine for rapidly accelerating the new liberalization of Ukrainian society. If you could elaborate on that and also respond to what kinds of reconstruction aid uh, is required now in, in Ukraine and, and where that might come from. Yeah, the shock doctrine, I mean, it's very clear. Uh, it's it's almost a textbook case, right? So Zelensky's party, Servant of the People, originally proposed a slate of reforms to the pension law and to labor law in Ukraine that were highly radical. In fact, um, it would eliminate the ability for public, for labor unions to, to collectively bargain um, before the war. And they were unable to do so. They didn't have enough support in the RADA. Um, after the war, uh, there was a, of course, a rally around the flag effect, and um, many of the leading opposition parties, in fact, all of them were banned, although their deputies remained in the Rada, um, and they were able to pass these reforms, which, uh, you know, even the ILO has criticized. These are these are not um, middle of the road reforms. They are the far right of the neoliberal European consensus, essentially. Um, and they're made use of it by the fact that the that the regime count the Zelensky government counts on not having any social mobilization against it because everyone is so focused on saving their loved ones from the Russian invasion uh, and in in allowing the state to do what it needs to do uh, to to protect the country um, and so it's become uh, this and and I want to point out here that it's not just Zelensky doing this himself right this is. EU aid uh, has, comes with a slate of conditions that strongly encourage this neoliberal turn. And of course, it's all framed as, you know, getting rid of inefficient Soviet-era institutions and so on. Uh, but it amounts to a massive reduction in social welfare spending, all of this uh, reform. So, so it really is a question of uh, what kind of Ukraine survives this conflict? Is it going to be a Ukraine that effectively, as I put it in my piece, right, is a gigantic special economic zone uh, that has certain trade privileges in relation to Europe, but has much weaker labor protections? Or is it going to be a country that's just and and actually offers 
a place to live for its millions of people uh, that is better than the Russian alternative, which I think can easily happen. Uh, but the EU is bent on imposing its neoliberal ideology on the recipients of its aid. And I think it's really important to address the second part of your question here. I think it's really important to take the spotlight away from the question of military aid, which, yes, is national is, is essential for Ukraine's survival. Uh, but the much greater needs of civilian reconstruction right now are barely being discussed because the weapons have taken up so much of the space. Uh, but it's the civilian reconstruction debt cancellation in particular, as I think is very essential, um, and the removal of conditionalities on this kind of aid uh, so as to remove the Zelensky government's uh, ability to wield those conditions to force out left-wing political forces in Ukrainian society. And, um, and you know, perhaps even... Uh, use some of the levers of that aid to pressure Zelensky to to um, withdraw some of his attempts to monopolize public space. You know, uh, there have been docu documented instances, for example, of protesters uh, on all kinds of issues, not even strongly political ones, being uh, drafted or threatened with conscription and being sent to the front as a result of their political activities. This is extremely troubling because it's uh, directly threatening protesters with violence, right? Um, and the state currently has... Uh, not a lot of coercive resources left, but if the war ends and it still has the same degree of intervention in street politics, uh, that's not going to be good news for Ukrainian democracy. Well, could you also talk about uh, how the war appears to be spreading beyond the borders of Ukraine? There was the recent drone attack on the Kremlin, and just this week, the cross-border raids by pro-Ukrainian Russian forces attacking the Belgorod region of Russia. So, I mean, what are your concerns about this uh, potentially escalating to the point, uh, you know, that is uh, potentially devastating? Uh, for the area, uh, but also potentially uh, the world. And even though you have reservations about uh, a possible ceasefire ending in something like the, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, situation or Korea, wouldn't a ceasefire nevertheless result in fewer and possibly no uh, lives lost uh, on the Ukrainian side? Um, I mean, I would like to think that, yes. I think I think a ceasefire certainly would be better than most of the available options at this point. Uh, the difficulty with these current cross-border attacks and the other terrorist, well, and the other, you know, acts of sabotage and so on, uh, which from a military point of view are totally defensible, but it's important to understand that these are not volunteer groups in any meaningful sense. These are uh, clients of the Ukrainian security services, right? And what they appear to be doing is they appear to be registering that Western governments are start starting to um, weary of their open-ended commitment to Ukrainian military defense, and I think are trying to provoke Russia into some kind of uh, radical course of action that's going to force the U.S. And, and NATO to take a more radical position. And in doing, and so they're trying to stage these kinds of attacks as more and more obvious in an attempt to get something like this to happen. Uh, obviously, that is extremely risky as a strategy, right? Uh, the risks of this war spiraling out into a nuclear or even a larger scale conventional conflict are not uh, great. Um, and, But at the same time, it's important to remember that because of the way that these forces are established within Ukrainian society, right, a ceasefire would not prevent this kind of thing from happening. There would be people both in Ukraine and in Russia interested in an immediate resumption of the conflict on any premises, and they would work to constantly sabotage this piece, and they would be able to say, look, these are just volunteers, these are just partisans. Uh, and both within Ukraine and within Russia, you have to remember, for example, that Wagner began as a plausibly deniable non-state organization. Um, so, uh, so it's really important to remember the broader stakes of this conflict and work towards a long-term resolution rather than just trying to stop the bleeding and hoping for the best. Dennis Pilash, your final comments. We just have 30 seconds. I would say that it's quite important now to uh, keep uh, solidarity with the people of Ukraine. And this means that, uh, yes, it needs, uh, they, we need all kinds of support. This includes actually military support, but it also includes this kind of humanitarian aid and uh, resuming the political questions like cancellation of the Ukrainian debt. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dennis Pilash, Ukrainian political scientist and historian. Uh, and thank you, too, to uh, Gregory uh, Fenigenev, a professor of Russian history at Georgetown University. We will link to your recent piece in Jacobin, headlined, Peace in Ukraine Isn't Coming Soon.